Hello everybody and welcome to the fourth session of the NZX Virtual Global Dairy Seminar for 2020, sponsored by StoneX, Interfood and Global Dairy Trade. So today we're going to um, take a look at the global supply and demand situation and the outlook for 2021. Um, dairy, I guess, has weathered the pandemic in, in a whole lot of different ways, depending on which continent you're on. Um, products like whole milk powder have really surprised um, by you know, failing to break free of a range that's a price range that's been established since late 2016. Um, while meanwhile, fats have sort of melted as um, in step with um, reduced food service demand. Um, skim and non fat have continued to find demand um, as, as inventory remains tight and, and product is moving. Um, the US has seen government um, interventions amplify um, the impacts of, of COVID and, and delivering violent price movements in cheese. Um, while European and global prices for, uh, for, for other commodities have, have remained a lot me more measured. So um, we've seen concerns over supply chain, um, lifting inventory, we've seen disgraded demand, um, and all against the backdrop of, of relatively buoyant milk production across the globe. So there's lots to talk about. Um, and to dive deeper into this, uh, we've got a great panel um, with Amy Castleton, Senior Dairy Analyst from the NZX, uh, Monica Ganley, Principal for uh, Quartera um, in Buenos Aires, uh, in Argentina, and Nate Donne, um, Director of Dairy Market Insights from StoneX joining us. So welcome all. Um, before we kick off, uh, I'm just going to go through the housekeeping. So um, please make sure, uh, attendees, that you have um, downloaded or um, joined the NZX event app um, in your web browser. Um, this, this app has got um, all of the networking features which enables you to contact and communicate with all of the registered attendees for the conference, of which there are over 800. Um, from all over the world um, in every corner of the value chain for dairy. Um, you have access to the Q&A, which will um, enable you to ask questions for, for each session, as well as live polling, which we're running. Um, remember, uh, we're also, also you can um, find the recordings uh, for the event, uh, for each event there as well, as well as details for the speakers and the sponsors. Um, so we are sharing the link to take you to the NZX um, event application now. Um, you'll see a bubble pop up in your um, go to webinar box. Uh, it'll be flashing red. If you click on that, you will then see the chat box and you can click on the link, which will take you to the website. Um, so uh, if you are, uh, so questions, uh, you'll be popping them into the app. Um, and we will pick up them at the end of the session. You can vote those questions up by clicking like, and then the ones with the most likes will uh, ask first. So get into voting as well as get into chucking your questions in there, that'd be great. Um, all attendees have been muted, so it shouldn't impact you hearing us. Um, but if you're having trouble, if you're having trouble, um, trouble hearing us, uh, look at these um, items on the left of your screen here, work through those, um, and if you're still having trouble and you can't hear us, remember we'll be sending out a recording after this. So if you miss anything, you can pick it up in the recording. So today we've got a couple of polls running in the app, uh, in the NZX uh, event app. Um, if you want to put your thoughts in there, we will uh, pick these up and run through them at the end of the session. They'll be running live for the entire conference and uh, you can continue to put your uh, thoughts in there and we'll, they'll be distributed to everybody at the end of the conference. Um, so, with intros out of the way, with the housekeeping out of the way, let's get into the, the actual session. And we're going to start with you, Monica. Um, we've seen Argentinian pump powder exports lift really significantly through 2020. Can you sort of describe what's happening and what's driving this? Sure. Uh, of course, whole milk powder is the primary product for South America. And I'll talk about Argentina, but I'll kind of lump Uruguay in there together because at least this year, they tend to be behaving relatively similarly. Uh, I think the key driver behind this is that we are seeing really strong milk production in both countries, uh, stronger than we've seen in years. 
This was driven by very strong margins, which persisted through most of 2020. And then also we had relatively favorable weather. If we think back to the beginning of 2020, there was a little bit of dryness in Uruguay, but we overcame that after the first quarter. And in Argentina, for the most part, the weather was quite favorable. So as a result, we really saw um, pretty dramatic figures in terms of milk production expansion. Uh, I think in Argentina, we're beginning to see that contract a little bit. Uh, Uruguay, the numbers are still really, really strong. As we move here into the final quarter of the year, it's going to be a little tougher in both cases to post such high figures just because when we do our year-over-year -year comparisons, it's going to be a little bit harder looking at the numbers that we had seen in the final quarter of 2019 as well. But uh, there's a lot of milk. There's a lot of milk in South America, and I think the vast majority of that milk is going to get dried into whole milk powder. So my expectation here is that we're going to have a lot of milk in the region. Um, keep in mind, I know this is probably a, a group of folks with a southern hemisphere bent, but for folks that are tuning in from the US or from Europe, keep in mind that we are moving towards our high production season, which we'll experience here at the end of October and into November. So we're also going to see a lot of milk coming online seasonally, which will also help to push those figures up as well. So I personally believe that we're going to have a lot of milk powder coming out of the region here in the next few months. Just for, for the audience, Monica, how much of that um, domestic production or production out of South America is consumed within South, South America and how much of it makes it outside into the likes of Southeast Asia and China? It can vary. Um, so traditionally, if we look back over the last five years, say, we've sort of seen this rotation where uh, at one point, both Argentina and Uruguay was sending a lot of uh, milk powder into Venezuela, say. Then uh, Brazil kind of took over as, as the chief destination. Of course, there's some pretty uh, beneficial tariff arrangements that exist there for product moving within Mercosur itself. Uh, and then last year, we really saw Algeria step up. And since then, we've seen a lot of product move from both Argentina and Uruguay into North Africa. Um, the, the destinations you mentioned, specifically China and Southeast Asia, aren't necessarily as popular. Uh, we have seen Uruguay in particular get a little bit of traction with product moving into, uh, moving into China. I think it was, gosh, if I'm not mistaken, the August figures that they were able to send um, several thousand metric tons, which is the most that they've sent to China. Speaking specifically, Uruguay whole milk powder exports into China. Um, the highest figure since I think 2014. So there's definitely more inroads being made. I know that's a uh, intriguing market in any in many respects for um, for Uruguay and, and Argentine processors. Uh, but at least at this point, the focus would be more on on Algeria and Brazil than in Southeast Asia. Yeah, no, that's great. That, that's that's some um, uh, good insight. So. I guess taking that on board and, uh, and and where South America is from a production perspective and going going gangbusters, um, have you got a view on where you see um, whole milk powder prices moving through 2021 as a result of that really strong production? Do you want to start with that, Monica? And what's your price view? And we'll go around the table um, uh, following you, Monica, with you next, Amy, please. Sure. Uh, well, to be to be very honest, I'm a little bit bearish here in the short term, especially as we do see a lot of the volume come online. Um, I do think, however, that as we move into 2021, we're in shape to see milk production get hit back a little bit. Um, some of the factors that I had referred to earlier in terms of weather, in terms of margins, I don't think are going to be well sustained into 2021. So as we move into the coming year, I do think we are going to see production move back, which will help to kind of support prices. So I think, you know, maybe if we're thinking in, the, in quite the short term, I think there's going to be enough product available to weigh down on prices, although consumption seems to be the big question mark this year, right? But, uh, but I think things are going to change pretty dramatically as we flip the calendar page and move into 2021. Cool, Amy. What are you? What about your view from um, New Zealand's perspective? Uh, I probably have a, a slightly different view on prices than Monica. So I think um, we'll probably hold at three thousand or thereabouts, perhaps just over for whole milk powder over the next few months. Um, there is talk of New Zealand getting a bit dry, and uh, we're also heading into our peak milk production season. So a few fears that milk production might start to fall back. Um, that would typically mean that whole milk powder prices are supported, um, at least in the short term. Um, we do also have the, the big question over consumption. Uh, Chinese buying has been a little bit slower on GDT lately, 
um, whether that's actually a fall in consumption or just because they've bought earlier than they normally would um, to get product in, in January um, is not totally clear yet. Um, but I, I expect prices will come back next year. Um, I, don't, I don't think that 3,000 sort of level will be supported for a particularly long time, just over the next few months. Well, Nate, um, we'll throw to you now. So uh, obviously the US is a relatively small um, producer of whole milk powder, but um, StoneX has got a you know a, a large number of clients who are um, using the NZX derivatives and and uh, and wider. What's your view of, of whole milk powder um, from from what you see? Sure. Well, uh, let me split it into to two responses. The, the first response is, given where global GDP is, uh, our models think the price should be about $2,500 a ton or $2,400 a ton. It should be much, much lower than it currently is. But prices have held up a lot better than expected, um, with the exception of South America. I think most of the inventory has moved out of uh, the major exporting countries. So we do see the price forecast has been shifting higher. So right now, I think whole milk powder, basis Oceania, bottoms out at about 27.50 in the first quarter and then moves up into that, that 31, 32 uh, type level by Q3. Cool, that's great. I love it. I love putting numbers on it as well. That's uh, the audience will like that too, I'm sure, Nate. Um, we're we're going to move um, into into a, um, a little discussion on, on the channel now, Amy. And, and, both A2 and Sinlay have both reported impacts um, relating to infant formula movements as a result of their Daigo network um, being disrupted uh, with less tourists and less international students um, traveling. That's um, slowing down that channel and, and they've both reported impacts. Um, so, so what do you believe this will result in in the short term um, as well as in the long term? Uh, short term, it will certainly have an impact. Um, so just just to note, that was very specific to Australia. Um, that's where a lot of that activity happens. Tourist students travelling over to Australia and then sending product back to China while they're there. Um, obviously, that's not an option at the moment. Um, so it, it will certainly have a have an impact in the short term. Um, A2 thinks it will have quite a significant impact on their earnings. Uh, this that's why the announcement around that one. Um, longer term, I think things will get back to where they were eventually, um, but it is reliant on borders opening back up and um, students being accepted back into the country, um, that's, that sort of thing. Um, so I've, uh, it's probably maybe best case scenario, not until later next year when things have opened back up, hopefully, assuming COVID is um, a bit more managed by that point. Um, um, yeah, it, it, it does depend on how COVID plays out and what happens with borders. Do we do we have a view on whether that um, demand will be displaced through more or moved into more traditional channels and more dis more traditional distributed channels rather than um, um, that I would expect, uh, Sorry, keep going, Nick. No, that's that that's uh, that was the end of the question. Um, I would expect some of the demand is displaced, but um, there is a reason for that channel existing. Um, there, I think some of those people in China that would have bought that product as an end user will uh, perhaps sub substitute a local Chinese brand or something cheaper that they have in country rather than um, going the more traditional route and buying New Zealand or Australian made infant formula. Um, through a more traditional channel. Brilliant, that's great. Thank you. We're going to move to you now, Nate, and we're going to um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, support programs in the US. Can you give us an update on where um, what the current um, government support programs are and, and and the impacts that you expect to see over the next three to six months? Sure. Most of what we have right now is really uh, ad hoc purchases by the governments. The traditional government purchasing program where they have a floor price for skim milk powder, butter and cheese, and they buy an unlimited amount of product, uh, that is not in effect. Uh, it's, it's not currently a, a part of the farm bill. So what we've seen is the government purchasing dairy products 
uh, and then donating directly to people who are in need or into our, our uh, school system. And it's been a tremendous impact, particularly on the U.S. cheese market. We've seen purchases of around $1.1 billion. We believe some of this has to be estimated because uh, the government is not releasing good statistics on the food box program. Um, but they brought in a tremendous amount of money purchasing somewhere in the range of two to three percent of all of the dairy solids produced um, June, July, and August. And it's had a big impact, again, particularly on the cheese price, where we went from a dollar a pound at the low uh, for CME cheese to, uh, to, to three dollars a pound a couple of weeks later, six weeks, seven weeks later. Um, so it's it's been very disruptive, uh, but also very supportive for U.S. cheese prices and for other dairy products as well. Because if we weren't moving this cheese through the government purchases and government programs, uh, the milk would be going into butter and powder and depressing those prices more than they currently are. Uh, so it's it's been a large and positive influence on the market. Now, the food box program was originally designed to run six months, and we're coming to the end of that at the end of October here. Uh, Theoretically, most or all of the money in the program has been spent. And so further large purchases for the food box program specifically will require new money to be allocated by Congress or by the USDA. It seems likely that if Democrats are in control that they will not continue to do this food box program, that further support to people who are in need will be done through other channels like increasing the funding for our uh, what they call SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which allows uh, low-income people to um, receive basically a preloaded debit card each month that they can use at grocery stores and supermarkets to purchase food. And so I, I, I think if the Democrats take control that that's where we'll see the, the, the funding shifted towards is lowering the thresholds for people to get into the SNAP program and then probably increasing the benefit that people receive once they're in the program. Uh, so instead of direct purchases uh, or semi-direct purchases by the government, it will be consumers who will be choosing what products to buy. From a consumer perspective, it's probably a better way to do things. Uh, it's less disruptive to the market overall, but it probably will not be as supportive for dairy products as the food box program has been. There are other programs that the USDA is using to purchase dairy products. They're using uh, what they call Section 32 funds. There's trade mitigation funds. Um, there's one or two other ones. The CARES Act put some money in there too. Uh, some of those programs will continue, but total this year, they've only spent about $150 million in those programs, while the food box program has probably spent about $960 million on dairy. So these other programs that will continue to operate in 2021 are much, much smaller and much less disruptive than what we've seen with the food box program. Do you expect direct payments to farmers um, to be within the policy suite for the Democrats? Not until the next election year. Very, very cynical of you, Nate, but I um, appreciate it. <laughs> well, uh, I, you know, I, on top of it, arguably margins have not been that bad for U.S. dairy farmers. It was looking very, very bad March and April. It was looking like record low margins. And so the initial rounds of payments to U.S. farmers make some sense in that context. But at this point, the money really isn't uh, needed. Yeah, um, that's that's a brilliant, brilliant answer. Really appreciate your uh, your insight there, Nate. So, Monica, we're going to jump to you around demand for dairy from a health perspective, um, and or rather from a nutritional perspective. Um, you know, resulting out of um, uh, you know, fear for for immune system. You know, COVID being you know driving people's towards um, high nutrition, high nutritionally dense food. Um, do you see this being a long term change um, in demand, or do you think it's going to revert back once uh, once the heat's sort of taken out of COVID as we move down, you know, through vaccine and uh, start to forget about it? 
It's a good question. Uh, we've definitely been seeing a lot of press recently about how, uh, exactly to your point, how uh, eating habits are going to change to try to find a diet that perhaps supports a superior immunological response. Um, in some senses, I think that, uh, you know, we're overly focused on the effects of the virus. And as we move down the line, we will begin to forget and we will begin to move back to um, you know, the, the habits that we had before. But I do think that for those of us who have lived through this strange year that is 2020, there will be some staying factors. And I think perhaps uh, if the dairy in industry can succeed in really making a strong connection between uh, dairy products and the benefits that they offer in that arena, perhaps there is a little bit of ground that can be gained in terms of uh, long-term preferences. Uh, I do think that, um, you know, there will be some shifts in terms of how people view health. I think people will begin to prioritize health in a different way than they had prior. Um, but I do think the, the onus is on the dairy industry to continue to work on the initiatives to prove the dairy industry is part of a, a wholesome diet um, and that dairy products can really offer those kind of benefits to, to the diet. I don't think it's a, um, a foregone conclusion, say. I think that these will be things that consumers are looking for, and I think the dairy industry uh, has an opportunity and a responsibility, as it were, to begin to capitalize on that opportunity. Nate or Amy, um, do you have anything to add to that around um, you know, demand that we've seen as a result of COVID and, and dairy seems to be moving pretty well? Um, any any other comments around that um, nutritional value or or health sort of story being sustainable or you know continuing? Uh, I, I think Monica covered it quite well actually. Not much to add from me. Cool. What I would toss right. in there is that Domino's Pizza's third quarter sales in the year in here in the U.S. were up 17 or 18 percent from a year ago. So it's not just the health-based decisions that are that are being made. Um, you know, on the margin, some of those health claims around some dairy products are are probably going to help. Um, but again, like Monica said, I don't know how long-lived it will be. Uh, Cool. No, that's um, that's great. So we're going to jump into supply now. Um, Nate, I'm going to toss to you and Amy. Perhaps you could pick up after. So European milk production remains relatively robust up on last year. Um, yet we've ex seen a pretty material drop in exports year to date, and primarily in skim. About 100,000 tons less has come out of the EU than 2019 year to date. Um, have you got any insight into where this milk's going? Um, is it a change in product mix or more storage in, in the EU or is it or something else? Nate, we'll start with you. Yeah, we have seen a substantial decrease in the amount of skin milk powder exported. We think the exports last year were largely drawing down the intervention stocks. Um, it, it wasn't coming out of fresh production. And if you look at total European exports on a milk equivalent basis, they have been running well above year ago levels. We've been looking at record cheese exports, very, very strong butter exports, good whole milk powder exports. Uh, so the milk that they're producing has been going uh, to, to exports, just not necessarily in the form of, of skim milk powder like they were last year. Um, you know, it's hard to get a reading on exactly how domestic disappearance inside of Europe is doing on a monthly basis. You have to make your own estimates on inventory levels, but we think domestic consumption inside of the Europe EU28 as a group is probably flat or slightly up from a year ago on a milk equivalent basis. And so we do think most of the growth in milk production in Europe so far this year has gone into the export market, but it's been in the form of cheese and butter and uh, whey products instead of skim milk powder like last year. Mm. Presumably with that butter, heightened butter production, there will be heightened skim production as well as a, as a result. Um, I, I view it a little bit more separated than that. You know, when you, at least here in the US, when you're thinking about the components, you have mozzarella plants that are throwing off extra cream and you have uh, uh, you know, other plants that are throwing off extra skim. It's 
not all the butter and powder that's being made is being made from a truckload of raw milk that's coming in. And so while they are co-products, butter and skim milk powder, it, it, they're not perfect co-products. And depending on the product mix that's being produced overall, you can see um, large increases in butter production and relatively small increases in skim production if the skim is being used somewhere else. Yeah, okay. Um, Amy, I'm going to jump to you from a New Zealand perspective. Um, uh, production has been pretty strong for the start of the season. October looks really good. Um, I guess a little bit of dry um, in the north. Um, have you got a view on, you know, we've got La Nina um, forecast. We're in, the, we're in it now. Um, uh, what implications that's going to have for New Zealand milk production for the balance of the season? Yeah, uh, yeah, things are certainly looking quite dry around the country at the moment. Um, Upper North Island, Canterbury areas are sort of um, the most dry. Um, Canterbury is probably less affected though because it's it's quite highly irrigated down there um, for those that have less of a view of how New Zealand works. Um, so um, they do have a bit of water, um, but the dry affects them less than it does the North Island. Um, there is a bit of stress from farmers that it's getting a bit too dry for the time of year in Waikato particularly. Um, we have had a little bit of rain this week, but we do need more. Uh, what that means for production, um, I did update our model last night just in preparation for this. We're still looking at an increase in milk this season, um, but perhaps to a lesser degree than what we were previously forecasting. Um, how long the dry conditions continue for will be the key question here. Um, so if we're only a little bit dry at the moment um, and then we return to normal, uh, it probably won't have too significant of an impact. We are at peak production, um, but it's not drought yet. So we're dry, but we're not in drought. Um, if it continues for several months, which given that we're talking La Nina is very likely, um, quite likely that we will experience a drought again this season um, and that will uh, put a hit on milk production. Um, however, I don't think we'll see an, a decrease in milk production. Um, we've had this several seasons in a row where we've experienced a drought but milk production still growing slightly. Um, so farmers will put in feed if they need to. Um, we're still looking at a good milk price this season, something over $6. Um, so farmers should have the money to put on feed and um, other inputs where they need to to even that out. Yeah, um, I'm going to dig a little bit into Europe for, for just a moment, Monica, and, um, and we, we can share this around as well. But um, you know, we're seeing imported feed into the EU being up, so pretty um, relatively warm summer. They've just come through from a production perspective, and a lot of feed being put in which is typical, um, but also more than usual from a feed perspective. Um, how have the local harvests for feed grains and feed corn uh, or, or corn bean? Um, and, and what is your expectation for how this will impact next year's production in Europe? Um, in South America or in Europe? In, in Europe. Um, I don't know that I can speak as, a, as knowledgeably on the European market, but I could give you my perspectives on South America, if that works. Cool. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we are also quite concerned, kind of to build on Amy's recent response, we're quite concerned here in South America about uh, the La Nina as well. Uh, similarly, the La Nina would bring us dry conditions. Um, and I really echo your comments, Amy, in terms of the length of the La Nina is what's giving me a lot of anxiety. Uh, when NOAA first started to forecast the La Nina, it looked like it was going to be a really relatively quick one in and out in a few months. Uh, and I feel like every time the forecasts come out, it gets stretched a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Uh, for months here in Argentina specifically, we've sort of been balancing on this nice edge where it's it feels like things are dry, maybe not so dry that we're really, really nervous just yet, but we're kind of getting there. Um, I think there's probably a few uh, dairy farmers in the provinces of Cordoba and Santa Fe who would disagree with me and say that it's already quite dry. And in fact, uh, just over the last few weeks, we're having some significant issues with fires in some of the provinces of Cordoba. So I think things are getting um, noticeably drier, and that's one of the bigger concerns I have 
um, moving forward. And it's one of the concerns I have as well in terms of how the um, the crop season will also develop in in the region and how that will also affect feed costs going forward. I think in your opening question, I had referenced margins, and to this point, margins have actually been relatively healthy. But we've seen milk prices uh, stymie, and we continue to see operating costs in the region move up and up and up. And when feed costs get more expensive, that's going to continue to put more and more margin pressure uh, on these farmers. So I think that, um, you know, looking forward into 2021, I think the margin situation and then as a result, the impact on milk production is going to be relatively severe. Um, but I will see the question about Europe to anybody else who feels equipped to answer it. Um, Nate or Amy, do you want to jump in on, on where um, European um, you know, feed production has is? And, and, and I guess the other thing from a New Zealand perspective is how that's going to impact the likes of PKE imports and PKE pricing. Um, Amy, maybe you want to jump in there? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, so what we've been seeing out of Europe is quite a, a variable harvest. Um, some areas have been perfectly fine, have good yields. Um, other areas, France particularly, have had uh, not very good harvest. The, the yields have been quite far down from what they normally would, would be, um, but quality is good. So anybody that is using their feed will have uh, a good quality outcomes because they do have good feed. Um, there's just not enough of it available. Um, so as a result of that sort of mixed harvest, we have seen more palm kernel going into Europe. Um, so we have experienced this before, but Europe's had a drought and um, thus they've increased their, their imports of palm kernel. Um, that's kind of sent palm kernel prices up a little bit. Um, they're not out of reach for New Zealand farmers yet, but um, they do tend to keep going up if Europe keeps buying more palm kernel um, just because it does limit the supply. Um, so for Europe's milk production, that typically means that it, it, uh, it evens it out, it keeps it at least flat if not growing um, because they are, are putting that imported feed in. Um, what it means for us is that palm kernel will become more expensive. Um, there has been a trend in New Zealand to try and move away from palm kernel anyway. Um, but if we do have a drought, that might become a bit of a problem. Oh, that's uh, a lot of the conciseness and a really great answer. Thanks, Amy. Nate, I'm going to jump to you. North American production um, has been um, has been going great guns. Um, at what point do, does this start to create some overhang? Um, you know, this increased supply start to create overhang and and uh, you know start to weigh on prices. Uh, next week is my guess, but it, it might take a little bit longer than that. Um, when we do the calculations in terms of underlying demand, uh, there's two things holding together the U.S. market. First is exports, and second is the government purchases. You know, we, we talked a little bit at the start about views on global demand, and while it's turning out better than expected, I still have serious concerns about global demand moving forward. And so. It, I think U.S. exports are going to slow down. Most of the money for the food box program has been spent. It's supposed to end here at the end of October, and there's nothing at the same type of magnitude lined up to come after it. And so we see the potential for a big drop in overall demand for U.S. dairy products in the next couple of weeks, uh, quite frankly. And even our current level of milk production is going to overwhelm that, that demand at least the way we see it coming together. Um, now, my concern is earlier this year, the cooperatives and milk buyers put into place these base over base milk uh, pricing systems where a farmer will get paid uh, the market price for for 90% of his milk or 90% or of what he produced last year and will receive um, sort of a, a, sometimes a price of zero on anything that he produces above that amount. In a lot of these programs, the structures are still in place in the background and cooperatives and milk buyers continue to warn farmers that these programs may be activated again in the future if we see demand disruptions. So we have the potential for a scenario where prices really fall out of bed November, December and get low enough that everybody gets concerned about the overhang again and uh, they put these programs back into place and we can quickly tighten milk production in the U.S. again. 
so short term the supply looks good um, if it weren't for the government programs and the exports it would be overwhelming underlying consumptive demand in the u.s and uh, i i think the supply could easily overwhelm a total demand here going into november and december it sounds like the amplification and volatility uh, in the u.s is probably um, here to stay as a function of those kind of programs being you know just potentially even available um, we're we're rapidly chewing through time so we're going to jump to to audience q a now um, we've got uh, a whole lot of questions coming in um, the um, and people are voting which is fantastic um, so the the first question i want to um to want to ask is monica um What's the year-on-year -year increase in production capacity in the in South America, and and where is that production capacity, and, and which type of products? I assume we're talking about manufacturing capacity here, and the truth is that yeah. in Argentina, especially, uh, there's a vast oversupply of capacity. Um, we have a long way to go, particularly in powder production, until we're going to have any kinds of concerns about capacity production. Uh, excuse me, about capacity. Um, what I would say that is that a lot of these facilities are outdated. A lot of them could use some updating. So I think that we, it's possible that we run into a situation where we could expand um, manufacturing, but we're going to be doing so at an inefficient pace, uh, which could not help uh, Argentine processors. Um, manufacturing here tends to be quite labor intensive. There's a lot of other costs associated. There's a lot of opportunities to streamline. Uh, manufacturing in the region, but I'm not concerned at all about production capacity um, of dairy products. And again, the vast majority would be in powders, um, but I think we have plenty of capacity to produce cheese as well. Great, thanks. Um, I've got a two-part question here that's uh, that, that's uh, gone over over two uh, two questions. So there seems to be a level of contradiction in terms of pricing. We're seeing supply up. Food box programs supporting US markets and then at the same time less buying on GDT. Then the, the, the question is why is this resulting in a bullish sentiment for Q2 and Q3 next year? Who wants to jump in on that one? I could jump in on it. Bullish Q2 and Q3. My my view on it is changing a little bit. I, when there's when the pandemic first started in, in the US, Europe, Northern Hemisphere, really, uh, back March and April. We were looking at this big drop in dairy prices. If things followed their normal path, it would take dairy farmers in the US and Europe three to six months to start to adjust their supply in response to these low dairy prices. And it would take another six, nine months before the supply would actually get cut enough to line up with the reduced demand. And then prices start to take off. And so the idea was uh, that we would be dealing with relatively low prices it would contract supply and then all of a sudden we would contract supply too much maybe demand starts to improve as we get the economy going again and then prices really take off and so early on and still built into some people's thinking mine included is the idea that we will get a rebound but really we've already seen a substantial rebound in u.s and european pricing and sort of that that supply demand shock and the intertemporal mismatch and the, the time that it takes to work itself out really isn't playing out. So instead of a big drop now and a big increase later, it's turned into still expecting a small drop here short term, which is gonna slow down milk production a little bit. Um, South America has their, their own issues. We, we think milk production is gonna be down, uh, particularly for Argentina as well. And so we, we do get some tightening on the supply side, Q1, Q2, and that does give us a little bit of upside Q3, Q4, um, but sort of the overall fluctuations are probably not going to be as big as we were thinking earlier. And that's that's good. I appreciate that. Thank you, Nate. Um, okay, so we're going to um, jump into Amy. I'm going to throw this to you. Further supply chain disruptions from COVID don't eventuate. Um, if we hypothesize that there's higher inventory um, and that's been part of the increased exports that we've seen has gone into inventory rather into demand do you think there's a potential for this to create an overhang if we don't get supply chain disruptions and that stock isn't needed 
Uh, yeah, there, there's definitely potential for that, and we have seen um, some countries, particularly around Asia, Southeast Asia, um, stocking up their supply chains a bit to, to make sure they don't have those disruptions. Um, so we could see a bit of an overhang of product at some point next year um, if there are no further disruptions to supply chains. Um, and, and that will certainly have an impact on prices if it does occur. Does anybody else want to um, add anything to that, uh, Monica or Nate? Just to kind of offer a different perspective on on some of the supply chain issues, I think that this phenomenon of seeing like stockouts and things like that was really limited to certain economies. So here, just to share the South America experience, for example, we definitely had an increase in retail purchases when the lockdowns went into effect and things like that. But uh, retailers were quoted as saying it was similar to what you would see around holiday buying. So it was elevated, but not, not crazy. Um, my personal experience, I never went to a grocery store that was stocked out of anything, whether it be toilet paper, flour, or whatever. Um, so I think, I think the experience was different depending on where you're looking. I think there are a few different reasons for that. One is probably just how much expendable income people have to spend on those kinds of products in great quantities at any given time. But I also think depending on where you are in the world, depending on how accustomed the supply chain is to dealing with major disruptions, whether it's from strikes, from roads being closed, or from any number of issues, I think that there's probably larger inventories built in at every step of the supply chain already. So I don't think there's been this kind of massive shift to react to the experience that we've had over the last few months, just to kind of offer a, a bit of a different color from, from this part of the world. Nate, anything to add from your perspective? Um, we do believe that there has been some buildup in uh, just in case inventories in some of these importing countries, but the amount that's been imported in the last couple of months, it's getting harder and harder to justify the continued strong imports as just inventory accumulation. Uh, so um, I'm starting to wonder if consumption is doing better than we think in some of these importing countries and maybe not all of this product that's going in or all of the increase in product that's going in is going to inventory. Great, concise, I love it. Um, keeping on the concise, Ben, um, Nate, I'm going to um, throw you this quick question which just requires a bullish or bearish view. Uh, what's your view on non-fat dry milk? Um, uh, deck 20 through June 21, well, actually three three months, bullish or bearish? My question is always bullish or bearish. Three. Bullish or bearish relative to what? Relative to the spot, relative to the futures, uh, relative to the risks? Relative, uh, relative to, I guess, the, the view today. Um, what is your view on volatility? Is it volume? Volatility? I am, hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, so Short December 20, are you view from where we are today, we think it's going up or down? Bullish or bearish? Uh, down from where we are today and then up again. Love it. <laughs> That's so good. Okay, um, one more question for you, Nate. Uh, reclassification of um, fat-filled milk powder, giving it, giving it's now got its own code. Um, do you think that's had an impact on the export numbers of skim out of Europe? I, I maybe uh, I don't I haven't looked at it very closely we're a little bit frustrated with it because we know not all of the fat filled is being captured in that new HS code and there's still quite a bit that's stuck in other spots that we're trying to estimate and so it hasn't added any clarity to the trade flows on fat filled from our view it's still very difficult to figure out how much is actually moving cool that's good right the last question it's going to go to you, Monica. Um, can you tell me what your view is on Mexican um, demand for non-fat? Oh, I think Mexico is having a tough year, going to have a tough year demand-wise, uh, similar to the comments that have made throughout the webinar. I'm having a little bit of difficulty justifying uh, the consumption picture with the data that we've been seeing so far. Now, I know Mexican imports were down and the last set of data we got out from the U.S or rather US exports of non-fat were down um, into Mexico. But I just think, gosh, like looking at the, um, the IMF ex uh, expectations that were released today, Mexico is expecting to have GDP contract 
10% this year? Like, how can you be in an economy that's contracting 10% and continue to see strong demand? So I really struggle to justify a continued strength in, in Mexican non-fat demand. But I've been proven wrong before, so we will see. <laughs> Um, that's uh, we'll we'll wrap up the Q and A there. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, I'm going to just have a quick review of the polls that we've had, and then we'll do a wrap up. So, um, right. So the uh, first poll that we've got here is around um, the spread between European um, uh, skim and, and US skim in, in six six months' time. Are we expecting that to tighten? widen and invert will stay the same and pretty strongly um, the view of the audience is that uh, that it will narrow so that's uh, that's that's interesting um, the next poll there which hasn't picked up um, so that's the end of today's session um, coming up next uh, the next session we have um, a panel reviewing uh, trends and, and food service and art through Asia um, that's coming up later this afternoon, so everybody tune into that, should be really good. And then again, more sessions coming up after that, you can see there on screen. So thank you um, very much for, for everyone who's tuned in, um, and a very, very, very special thanks to um, Amy, Monica and Nate. Um, we're really grateful for your insight and the time we've given. So uh, thank you very much. And to StoneX um, as our gold sponsor, um, grateful to you for all the support that you give to growing the NZX market. So thank you very much. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you all uh, again on the up upcoming sessions uh, and uh, have a nice uh, morning, evening or afternoon, depending where you are. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.